Scott Pilgrim is a comic series written by Brian Lee O'Malley, a mixed race Canadian currently located in the US. The first volume of Scott Pilgrim was released in 2004, with the final volume being released in 2010. These all saw full color re releases from 2012 to 2015. When the novels were initially released, they were frequently met with critical praise and reward. People loved Scott Pilgrim for a variety of reasons. Most of them being that the art style is interesting and innovating, deceptively simple, and action packed in a way you wouldn't expect. Casual fans often related to Scott as a character and frequently desired a Ramona of their own. However, as time has gone on, many people have begun to apply a much more critical lens to Scott Pilgrim and begin to ask some questions about its writing and story. When I first read Scott Pilgrim, I was probably 16. I live in Utah, but I was out in Nevada with a friend, visiting his mom and grandparents. I somehow never managed to connect to his grandparents' Wi-Fi, so I ended up being disconnected from the internet for a solid week. During this time, my friend got a box set of Scott Pilgrim for Christmas, and we both blasted through the entire collection. At the time, I remember saying it was good, but not really being able to put my finger on why. It was funny, absolutely, but something about the whole plot and various characters left me feeling like it was lacking. I remember specifically not liking Knives Chow's arc, but that's about it. So, I decided to revisit the entire series. Over two days, I reread and took notes on all six volumes of Scott Pilgrim, and I have some thoughts. If you're familiar with the Scott Pilgrim series and don't need a refresher, feel free to skip to the timestamp on screen now. I'll be summarizing the entire series in this segment. Before I summarize the story, I'm going to tell you about all of the important characters. Scott Pilgrim is a protagonist, a 23-year-old guy who plays games, is a member of the rock band Sex bob and is unemployed. Ramona Flowers is the next most important character, being Scott's love interest for the majority of the story. Kim Pines is the drummer for Sex bob and an old friend of Scott's. Steven Stills is a guitarist and vocalist for Sex bob and also a good friend of Scott's. Knives Chow is a Chinese-Canadian high school student. Wallace Wells is Scott's gay roommate who pays for basically everything. Stacy Pilgrim is Scott's younger sister. Gideon Graves is a menacing figure we keep hearing about but never really see. Julia is Steven's off and on girlfriend everyone hates, and Joseph is a gay roommate. With that out of the way, let's start from the beginning. Scott is dating Knives. The first volume opens with this, as well as how the two of them met. There's also some racism concerning Knives and her parents, but that's besides the point. Scott and Knives start going out, and Scott takes her to his band practices. She's incredibly inspired by Scott's band, and she starts to change her demeanor. Later, Scott takes Wallace to Knives' school. Wallace says to Knives, you're too good for him, but Scott and Knives continue going on a date. Knives makes her crush and admiration for Scott clear. After this, Scott begins to see Ramona in his dreams. He immediately forms an obsession. He also does not fail to creep on her. Scott then is taken to a party by his friends, where he meets and talks to Ramona. He makes it clear he recognizes her from his dreams. This is awkward for both of them, and so Scott leaves and says he'll just leave her alone forever. This was a lie immediately. Scott then asks around about her, and Julie confirms she invited Ramona. Stephen Stills accidentally drops that Ramona recently had a breakup. Scott's obsession ramps up. Scott orders a package to try and see Ramona. He then waits by the door for the package. Knives knocks, and Scott realizes he forgot entirely he was going to hang out with her. He is distracted the entire date. That is, until Knives kisses him. This page speaks for itself. At band practice the next day, Stephen reveals that they have a show on Wednesday. Knives is excited and vows to see the show. The next day, Ramona delivers the package. Scott immediately asks her out, and also accidentally admits his obsession. Somehow, Ramona agrees to hang out with him. They go on a date. It's basic date stuff. They go back to Ramona's place, and things escalate. Scott stays the night, and invites Ramona to his band's show on Wednesday. Oh, and during this time, Scott keeps getting correspondence from someone named Matthew Patel. I brushed past that a bit. It's just foreshadowing, so I didn't really care to bring it up. This page is still important, because Wallace pushes Scott to break up with Knives. Scott then goes to band practice and fails to break up with Knives. Sex bob then shows up at the show. So does Knives, who kisses Scott. Ramona enters, then Scott panics and runs backstage. While another band is performing before Sex bob Stacy and Ramona meet. When they come out, they find that the crowd has been knocked entirely unconscious by the previous band. Then, Sex bob performs, only to be interrupted by Matthew Patel coming to fight Scott. Scott kicks his ass and runs off with Ramona. Riding a train, Scott and Ramona basically confirm to each other that they're dating. This marks the end of Volume 1. Volume 2 opens with a flashback scene of Scott at Catholic school. Here's the skinny. Scott befriends a girl named Lisa. He also befriends Kim by working with her on a geography presentation. Lisa and Scott want to start a band but are missing a drummer. Kim is a drummer. Kim is kidnapped by a rival school and Scott has to rescue her. 
He does as such, and then the two of them start dating immediately. The three of them form a band. Scott and Kim's relationship escalates, then Scott moves to Toronto and they break up. When we get back to the present, Wallace and Scott are riding a bus. Wallace drops an ultimatum. Break up with knives, or he's telling Ramona everything. As a result, Scott finally breaks up with her. Later, Scott invites Ramona over to his place for a date. She also stays the night. Scott then prepares to fight Ramona's next ex. In the meantime, Ramona runs into Stacy again. Also, Knives starts to stalk Scott. Knives then has an emotional breakdown and calls her friend Tamara over to help her dye her hair. Tamara calls her out a bit for her behavior, but mostly doesn't seem too invested. Scott fights Ramona's next ex and wins by default. Ramona and Stacy hit up the Toronto Reference Library, where they get attacked by Knives. This scene does an excellent job framing Knives as being completely crazy and off the rocker. Scott gets a call from her previous ex, Envy Adams. Envy invites Scott to open for her band, The Clash of Demon Head. Sex bob has mixed feelings about taking on this show. Ramona, Scott, and the band show up to the party that Envy invited them to. A lot of other general personal drama happens here. Ramona also reveals that Todd, Demon Head's bassist, is her third evil ex. This ends Volume 2. Volume 3. Scott starts a fight with Todd after Envy drags out the awkwardness. There is then a flashback scene where we see Envy's history with Scott, which is interspersed throughout the book. It details Envy's change from a dweeby weeaboo to who she is today. After Scott gets his ass kicked a bit, Envy calls for a break and everyone goes their separate ways. Scott and Ramona meet with Wallace and other Scott and have pizza. The scene is eh, but Wallace manages to be amazing, as always. Ramona and Scott go on a date, they skip out on seeing Envy and Todd again, and then share stories about exes. The sharing stories about exes is the important part. Then, there's a page dedicated to Knives being melancholy and introspective. Anyway, back with Envy and the band, Todd is cheating on her. Scott gets ready for the opening for Demon Head. Most of these scenes showcase character tensions. Scott, however, finds Knives and they talk. It's a real conversation. Knives has learned a lot. Well, she learned things to a degree. Meanwhile, Ramona and Envy fight. For some reason. Envy also has a few things to say about Ramona's apparent ex, Gideon. Envy finds out about Todd cheating and tries to beat him up, only for him to beat her up, and then Scott and Todd fight. Todd is defeated by a last minute poorly set up day of sex machina. After Todd is kaput and sex bob performs, Scott and Envy have a farewell. This closes Volume 3. Volume 4 starts with Julie's birthday on a beach scene. It's not important. Also, Knives is here. Kim moves in with Joseph and Holly. Scott and co. help her move. Right now, it's mostly slice-of-life stuff. Later, Scott runs into Lisa, his friend from the flashback. Lisa and Scott catch up a bit, and Scott invites Lisa to the next band practice. There's a scene with Knives and Tamara where someone apparently cut up one of her photos of Scott. Scott gets a job at Steven's workplace. Kim and Scott get attacked by what appears to be another ex, but narrowly escape. Everyone is hanging out later that night. Knives is here again. Wallace and Scott's lease in their apartment is almost up, and they have to decide what they want to do after that. Scott runs into Ramona's actual ex, Roxy the Lesbian Ninja. Also, Ramona seems to be avoiding Scott at this point. It's part of her character arc. At Scott's job, Ramona and Roxy are catching up, and Scott freaks out about it. Roxy's conspiracies about Scott cheating are getting to Ramona, which is likely compounded by Lisa having a crush on Scott. In a turn for the ironic, Ramona's jealousy and distrust ends up pushing Scott closer to Lisa, and then towards the possibility of actually cheating. He doesn't do it, though. Oh, remember the cut-up photo of Scott? And then the ninja guy that attacked him? Turns out that's Knives' dad. While Scott flees from Knives' dad, he ends up in Ramona's mind, where... Things happen. Ramona shoves Scott out of her mind, they talk about things, and then it's revealed that Roxy is staying with Ramona. Ramona then leaves, mysteriously, and then Scott runs off confused and upset. Things happen, then Scott goes back to Ramona and has to fight off Knives' dad, doesn't have a sword, but then gets one from professing his love to Ramona. Scott then promptly defeats Roxy and finds out who Ramona's next set, yes, I did say set, of exes will be. Oh, and Knives' dad fucks off because he's really no longer needed for the plot. Scott moves in with Ramona and his friends help him move. Knives' dad gives her permission to date white guys. Sex bob continues the recording, a thing that started this volume. And then the volume ends. Volume 5 opens with Scott's birthday and him turning 24. This is no relevance to the plot, but it's fun to just see little things like this. Immediately after, Scott and Ramona are at a day of the dead party being thrown by Julie. 
but it looks suspiciously like a Halloween party. Also, the twins are here. They summon a robot to fight Scott in their place, which happens many times over the course of the volume. Characters have little chats with each other in the meantime. Then at Kim's house, recording for the album is still going on, but Steven calls them together for a practice and reveals that they have a show on Sunday. Knives is at school with Tamara, and it seems like she's finally starting to put two and two together. At the show, the band is not prepared and is going to do poorly. Knives confronts Ramona in the bathroom and starts a fight. By the end of the fight, Knives spills the beans about Scott cheating with them both. Scott spends the night with Wallace after Ramona asks for some alone time. Wallace tells Scott what he's dug up about Gideon, the guy who's actually been foreshadowed since the start, but is only now finally getting paid off. Scott then stays the next night with Kim. Scott puts Kim up to meeting with Ramona, and Kim does it. The three of them chat, and cheating gets brought up when Ramona gets upset. At Julie's next party, Knives is macking on, quote, Captain Homo, end quote, or Stephen Stills, as normal people would say. One of the twins foreshadows that Ramona. And Kim and Ramona also get some quality time together. After the party, Kim gets menaced by the twins. Unrelated, Scott and Ramona have sex. Afterwards, Ramona confronts Scott about cheating. After the talk, the next morning, Ramona cuts her hair in a symbolic act while Scott goes to rescue Kim from the twins. The twins try to throw off Scott by telling him about Ramona being a cheater, as if that wasn't apparent based on Ramona's past stories with guys, but Kim saves the day by pretending Ramona texted her back. Scott beats the twins and rescues Kim. Scott goes to Ramona and she disappears in a flash of light. Scott tries to sort out his feelings and stays with friends because he locked himself out of Ramona's house. Scott's parents end up hooking him up with a new apartment. Then Gideon finally calls Scott. This marks the end of Volume 5. Volume 6 opens with Scott dreaming. He's in his lonely desert again, and he's chasing down Ramona and Gideon the cat. Gideon the human shows up at the end of the dream. Wallace is talking with Scott, and he points out that Scott has been a sad sack for months. Steven has a new band, Scott has a nightmare, and then he goes to Steven's show. Knives is an adult now. Scott is a creep about it, but this time not just because he's a creep, but also because he's sad and because Wallace pushed him toward having sex. Anyway, Knives now has finally moved on and is learning things about herself and her life. Mostly. Mostly. Scott embarrasses himself trying to be rude to Envy at a party. Envy ends up asking him out for coffee. He also embarrasses himself there. Gideon the cat comes back to Scott. Scott then hangs out with Envy and embarrasses himself again. Turns out, Envy took Scott to face Gideon. Scott flees. Wallace sends Scott in a bus, and Scott goes to visit Kim. Scott then fucks up again, and at this point, I don't understand how any reader can't hate him. Also at this point, the story behind Scott's, quote, rescue of Kim is revealed. Turns out, Scott's version of it was a lie. Scott then fights Nega Scott and comes to term with his conflicting and confusing emotions. Gideon and Envy are talking about costume and lighting stuff. Gideon is shown to be a bigger creep than Scott. Scott shows up to Gideon's club, and we get another roll call. Damn it, I could have been calling these scenes roll calls the entire time. Envy starts a performance for her solo album, and she opens up the song to let Scott know what's going on. Gideon and Scott fight, and they both realize that Ramona isn't with either of them. Gideon then fucking murks Scott on the spot. Anime bullshit then happens for 40 pages. Anything of substance is either bad or immediately undone, but let me try to make things fast. Ramona appears to Scott while he's dead. Scott comes back to life thanks to the one-up he had from earlier. Gideon is generally a weirdo creep and reveals that he messed with both Ramona and Scott's mind. Scott fights Brand Gideon, gets a new sword from the power of understanding, and then he and Ramona kill Gideon. Everyone talks about stuff, loose ends get wrapped up, and the story concludes. Now we can get into the actual criticism of the piece. I have it split up into multiple sections, starting with discussions of individual characters and then following up with some broader trends in the story. I'll close off with discussing Brian Lee O'Malley's role in writing this too, because I think it's very illuminating. With that, let's get started. Scott Pilgrim is a relationship drama. It's all about Scott, his current relationships, and the relationships of his past. The primary goal of the story is to show how Scott changes and grows as he goes from relationship to relationship and from day to day. The story starts with Scott at his lowest point, dating a high schooler, and ends with him at his highest point, with the woman he loves and both of their baggage having been rifled through. This is not a bad thing. In fact, I really commend Scott Pilgrim for having a main character who starts off as indubitably a piece of shit. The problem is when Scott never legitimately improves. 
See, the first two volumes put a lot of effort forward to let you as a reader know that Scott sucks. His friends consistently make active efforts to point out that Scott's relationship with Knives is wrong, and he's also depicted as being dismissive and borderline abusive to her. However, that effort is dropped once Scott finally does break up with her. From there forward, Knives is the one who is portrayed as being the problem with their relationship. She's obsessive, a stalker, and, dare I say it, crazy. At least that's what the comic says. Knives' character arc sucks. It's terrible. Knives was a 17-year-old girl that got taken advantage of by someone six years older than her. Yet the story constantly portrays her as being, quote, crazy, and never brings to light the damage that Scott did to her. Knives is a teenager, and it's easy to believe that as a teenager, she would be susceptible to Scott's unknowing manipulation. He listened to her, talked with her about the things that mattered to her, and introduced her to music that had a lasting impact on her growth as a person. She lived in a restrictive and conservative household, which has issues with racist representation that I'm not especially qualified to speak on, and Scott was the first exposure to things that she wouldn't have found at home or in school. This also means it's believable that Knives would have stalked Scott and gotten angry at Ramona for, quote, stealing him from her. It's easy to misdirect your anger away from the actual source of your emotional hurt. Scott stopped dating Knives, so Knives lashed out the new person he was dating. Then, after obsessing over Scott for volume after volume, Knives realizes that Scott wasn't actually good for her. She realizes that he cheated on her and that that was not a good thing. But she then immediately says that it wasn't his fault he cheated, and changes absolutely not at all. Despite what good Scott might have brought to Knives' life, he still absolutely used her. She's never allowed to come to terms with this. Scott should have been an important learning experience for her. She should have come to terms with the fact that Scott, while influential to her growth, was ultimately not good for her. That doesn't happen. Scott never sees any real consequences for what he did to Knives. He never apologizes to Knives for what he did, and Knives ends up idolizing him up until the very end. Knives is not only an example of Scott failing to face the failings of his past, but also serves as an excuse for Scott to continue ignoring his failures. Knives' character was ignored in favor of Scott's. She forgives him time after time and acts as a prop for Scott's growth. At least, what little growth there is. While all of the women in Scott Pilgrim serve as props for Scott's growth, none of them are nearly as egregious as Ramona is. Ramona is such a prop that she fails to even be a character. She has absolutely no personality of her own. The only traits she seems to have are mysterious and sassy. Her mystery is more in that she refuses to talk about herself whenever she can get away with not, and her sass mostly exists in mocking Scott's masculinity and mocking other women in sexist fashions. Even in their first date, she avoided answering any of Scott's questions by instead just turning the questions back on him. There's a scene where Ramona asks Scott what he likes about her, and he doesn't even have a real answer. I have no idea why these two are dating. They have no reason to be interested in each other. And that's doubly true for Ramona. In her first interaction with Scott, he's a creep to her. Two more interactions in, he's a creep to her. When he asks her out, he continues to be a creep. There's no exploration into why Ramona chose to agree to go on a date with him. Sure, he strong-armed her with the package at first, but she could have just stood him up on the date. Yet, she didn't, and she continued to see him. There's never even an inkling of a reason why Ramona went on that date with Scott. In fact, there's never really a reason she dates anyone. The reasons she dated people were typically because they were fun flings. Her most serious relationship for Scott seems to have been Gideon, but we don't learn anything about their relationship or why she's hung up on him. We don't see how her relationships and exes changed with time. That's something that bothers me greatly. We meet every single one of Ramona's ex-partners, and meeting all of these people should give us an incredible glimpse into Ramona's character and love life, and yet we still manage to learn nothing. None of these exes tell Scott anything about what it was like to date her, except the twins, and all they say is she cheated on us. Ramona being impulsive and dating men on whims and dumping them just as fast could have been a character trait, but... This amounts to the second most important character in the series being underdeveloped and hollow. However, O'Malley gives us insight into why this is the case. O'Malley confirmed that he didn't know who Ramona was during an interview with the AV Club. 
When the interviewer mentioned the extra attention Ramona was receiving during Volume 5, O'Malley said, Yeah, as it went on, I realized Scott doesn't know anything about Ramona, and I knew barely anything about Ramona, so I just really wanted to learn about her. So Volume 5 becomes as much Ramona's story as Scott's, and then in the end, we can bring them both together, and it works. This translates roughly to, I didn't write her very well. Despite that, O'Malley also confirmed in this interview that Ramona is his favorite character. As a result of that, there's only one scene where she appears to have any depth. During a scene in Volume 5, Scott and Ramona are at home and chatting. Ramona asks Scott how he's able to get over his breakup so fast, specifically with Envy. Envy and Scott broke up two years before this. This scene implies that Ramona has issues with getting over her exes, or at least an ex. This contrasts with all of her previous statements with exes where she claims that her dating them wasn't a big deal. I really, really wish there were more scenes like that. That scene gives Ramona some amount of depth, and it makes the mystery part of her personality more pronounced. She's clearly hiding something from Scott, and us, by extension, but we don't know exactly what. It gives her a moment of vulnerability to the reader. Unfortunately, I don't entirely know what that scene was meant to amount to. However, I think it was supposed to serve as foreshadowing for Gideon Graves. Gideon seems like the one ex she's really hung up on. She mentions him casually during her first date with Scott. Anytime Ramona brings up Gideon and Scott tries to ask more, she clamps shut. She names a cat after him. She writes a letter to officially break things off with him, but never sends it. There's something up with Ramona and Gideon, but we are never really told what. Gideon is foreshadowed throughout every volume before his actual introduction, and he becomes more and more obvious as we get closer and closer to Volume 6 and the final confrontation with him. More importantly, we get to find out why Ramona is so stuck on him. What did he give her that she can't stop thinking about? What drove her away from him? When we finally meet Gideon in Volume 6, we find out the answers to those questions. Gideon was a weirdo dirtbag that messed with Ramona's mind to keep her under his thumb. Also, he messed with Scott's memory while he was at it. Also, he's kept his last six girlfriends cryogenically frozen because he loves all of them and waits for the day when they'll all date him. Gideon... is a lot to unpack. Despite how much effort goes into foreshadowing Gideon, we don't see a worthwhile payoff for it. We see no depth or intrigue from his character. Worse yet, his shoddy writing undermines the characterization of both Ramona and Scott up to this point, which is a fucking feat if I've ever seen one. So, in my summary, I said that the fight with Gideon was anime bullshit for about 40 pages. Turns out, it's actually about 90 pages. See, you can't foreshadow a villain for five books and not have a huge and amazing final conflict. If Gideon turned out to be a small fry like the rest of the exes, readers would be disappointed. Yet, somehow, his current portrayal is even worse than if he was underwhelming. See, the thing is that Gideon isn't a person. I mean, none of Ramona's exes are really people, just weird caricatures, but Gideon is so much worse. When Ramona scoffs off her previous exes, it's easy to believe because those exes are just weird, one-note jokes. They honestly don't even matter to us readers, and as a result, it's believable when Ramona says that they don't matter to her. However, Gideon clearly does matter. He weighs on her mind through the entire relationship with Scott up until she and Scott kill him. I said earlier that our questions about Gideon were answered, but it turns out that was a lie, and I'm a liar. In the 90 pages of anime bullshit, Ramona and Gideon don't talk about what their relationship with each other was really like. As such, it's completely impossible to actually see what either of them legitimately believe about each other or why they're both still hung up on each other. It can be surmised that Gideon is an abuser from the way that he stalks Ramona to his treatment of his previous exes, but we barely see any of that. To the reader, Gideon is another wacky anime villain ex-boyfriend who's so over-the-top evil that we can't really understand why Ramona is still hung up on him. However, think a little more critically, and it becomes clear why Gideon is like this. Gideon's obsession with Ramona is due to an obsession with control. He constantly ignores whomever he's currently dating in an effort to find and control whomever he was dating last. However, the only instance of this that's shown is when Gideon pushes Envy away when she worries about him while he's fighting Scott and Ramona. This moment is meant to create a connection between Scott and Gideon, 
because Scott gains the power of understanding from seeing this. Immediately before Scott suddenly gains this sword, he's having flashbacks of all of his breakups with his exes. I think this is meant to imply that Scott understands Gideon's hurt from his breakup with Ramona, but there are some heavy flaws with this implication. For starters, one of the breakups that Scott flashes back to is when he dumped knives. In no way was Scott's breakup with a minor that he is six years older than equal to Ramona running away from Gideon because he's negligent. In fact, Ramona running away from Scott isn't even equivalent to her running away from Gideon. For one thing, Gideon didn't have to fight six previous evil exes from Ramona to date him. For another, we can't even be certain that Ramona was Gideon's most successful relationship like it is for Scott. He has six others trapped in cryosleep, and any one of those could have been more successful than his run with Ramona. Gideon's obsession with control is in no way equivalent to any of Scott's relationships, even his unwitting manipulation of knives. Just having a breakup is not at all something that you can just immediately understand on such a deep level that you gain a big cool sword from it. Breakups are varied, and the circumstances around them are not the same every time. This same anime bullshit scene has a moment that more effectively ties Scott and Gideon together, though. This image is a reflection of two similar ones that Scott previously had in the story. This gives the comparison between Scott and Gideon that the story wants you to see, but it's the only example of this comparison that actually adds up and means something. This shows that Scott and Gideon are both self-absorbed and think about themselves before anyone else. Still, that's the furthest it goes. I tried to look up other interpretations to see if maybe I was just missing something here, and the fandom wiki for Scott Pilgrim claims that he gains the power of understanding, quote, after Scott realizes that Gideon is just as bad at relationships as he is and swears to defeat him, end quote. That's a weak interpretation, so I looked for something stronger. Jason Cohen from secrethideoutblog.wordpress.com claims, quote, Scott understands that he hurt people, but he also learns that he manipulated his own memories to make things better than they actually were. He didn't save Kim from an evil mastermind like he thought he did. He stole her from some kid that she was dating at the time. He understands who he is and what he's done, and only then can he stand up to Gideon and win Ramona back. He realizes that Gideon is his true opposite. Gideon doesn't forget. He remembers. He is a collection of girls who didn't love him and are locked away, awaiting the day when they'll all go out with me. Gideon actually imposes his selfish desires on others, which is something that Scott never wanted to do. He understands that this is what he could have been, and he knows he has to stop him. At this crucial point, Scott gains the power of understanding to defeat Gideon. End quote. So, I like the idea behind that interpretation. It claims that Scott uses Gideon as a model for what he is as well, but that they differ in specific ways that allow Scott to diverge himself from Gideon. However, it fails to recognize an incredibly important aspect of Gideon and Scott's relationship, as well as Gideon and Ramona's. I mean no disrespect to Cohen, but that's an incredible thing to miss and or leave out. Turns out, the reason Ramona was still hung up on Gideon is because he jammed something in her called The Glow. I brushed past it earlier, but we really need to break it down here. It's apparently a form of emotional warfare where it traps you in your head and makes you fight with your issues forever. Apparently, this made Gideon rich and also his weapon he's been using. I guess it's infectious because somehow Scott also caught it and it allowed Gideon to mess with his memories too. The glow is easily the worst part of the series. It isn't fleshed out very well at all. What activates it, how it really works, and why it gives Ramona and Gideon access to the subspace are not defined at all, not to mention how it let Gideon change Scott's memories. It's just some sort of secret weapon that Gideon infected Ramona with and used to torment her. He also claims that it has no cure, but this isn't really faced after Gideon is defeated. There's this panel that implies it's spread through headbutting or just head contact, but still, not defined. I've mentioned that Scott had fantastical recollections of how certain events in his past happened, but Gideon reveals that those recollections are wrong, and that he was the one who changed Scott's memories to make them more exciting. This absolutely fucking sucks. This implies that a huge reason Scott is such a piece of shit and doesn't properly remember things isn't because he's biased in his own favor and changed his memories to suit himself better, but instead because a big bad villain made him remember things wrong and therefore he became a worse person because of that. 
I have reread the fight scene over and over, and I can't think of any way that this enhances the story. All that this does is prove Scott right. It's not his fault that he's a bad person. He was turned into one by an outside force. Scott never needed to face his past to improve, because he actually needed to face a guy named Gideon. Ignore that he was actually a piece of shit outside of the memory changes, just pretend that Gideon is the real reason he sucks. This also implies that the reason Ramona is hung up on Gideon isn't because of her own emotions that she needs to get past and learn to cope with, but instead because Gideon forcefully placed himself in there and refuses to let her go. This is contradicted when Ramona does stand up against her mind Gideon, but the mind Gideon wouldn't even be there if the real Gideon hadn't shoved himself in her brain. Neither of these characters need to face their internal flaws or emotions because Gideon created them. Gideon is a bad villain. His motivations are bad, his presence in the story beyond his foreshadowing is bad, and the plot reveals he throws out are bad, especially the glow. So, I've gotten to this point of the video without talking about Scott. In my previous draft of this, Scott was actually the first character I talked about. However, I chose to place him at the end of the list because I find that pointing out how he fails as a character is much easier when you have the context of Scott's relationships with other major characters of the series. Scott starts the series as a terrible person. Volume 1 and 2 are dedicated to Scott's bad relationship with Knives and how he's terrible to her. This is a good thing. It makes for interesting storytelling, and gives Scott the opportunity to grow as a character. However, this opportunity is never taken. Once Scott breaks up with Knives, all responsibility for his actions are taken off of him. The story just lets him be the good guy and doesn't fret a whole lot in making up for what he's done wrong in his past. This allows Scott to feel like he's become a better person and improved because he's no longer dating the high schooler. He doesn't need to apologize to the person he hurt because he's moved on. Also, the series just chooses to ignore how Scott was a creep to Ramona, so hey! Scott's arc ends when he defeats Ramona's last evil ex and gets back with her. He's faced all of his problems, come to terms with all of them, and has all of his friends behind his back. Everything is good. Everything is perfect and great. That's obviously not true. What the structure of the story actually tells us is that Scott is a character who's only good for as long as he is dating someone that he wants to be good for. All of his growth happens while he's dating Ramona, and he becomes an even worse person than before when she's gone. Near the end of the series, Scott ends up relapsing from his improvement really, really hard. See, when Scott gets depressed because his longtime romantic partner of, at least, nearly a year disappears, one he moved in with, it's justifiable. Yeah, of course he'd be sad about that. However, the behavior he displays while he is depressed shows that he has not changed. At the start of the story, he's a weird creep who obsesses over some girl he met in his dreams and stalks her at a party. During this depressive phase, a whole five volumes later and nearly a year in fiction's time, he propositions all of his exes for casual sex and even kisses one without her consent. Scott's form of self-improvement is based entirely upon his relationship with Ramona. Whenever he does something good that shows him to be a better person, it's always while with Ramona. He never apologizes to his friends about the wrongs he did to them, and barely does anything to self-reflect and realize where he failed. This is in line with his character, actually. See, Scott has a history of not taking fault. He's changed his memories a lot through his life. When Scott was a teen, he beat up Kim's at-the-time boyfriend to date her. He lies about how she was stolen in order to justify it in his head, which ignores Gideon changing his memories, but ah. Uh... However, even when he is confronted about this fact by Kim in Volume 6, he doesn't really say anything about it and instead just runs off after facing Shadow Scott and remembering everything. When Scott and Envy finally run into each other, Scott fights Todd as he is required to. However, during the fight, he implies that Todd ruined Envy and says, she used to be so nice. Yet, it's incredibly clear to us, the readers, that Envy became Envy long before she started dating Todd. In fact, she comes out as Envy to Scott before she did to anyone else. Scott should be well aware that Envy chose to change on her own, but instead chooses to blame it on Todd. He has so many opportunities to ask himself, where did I go wrong, but instead chooses to blame his problems on outside sources still or just ignore the source. The closest we'll get to him recognizing his failures and improving is in Volume 3, 
where Scott admits to Knives that it wasn't right how I treated you either. Note that he admits fault, but doesn't apologize. He also was incredibly vague about what he did, too. Taking all of this into account, Scott's character arc is this. Scott is a bad person. He dates Ramona and gets better. She dumps him and he becomes a worse person, then they get back together and he's a good person again without actually doing anything to change. Scott is a character who is uninterested in being a better person unless there is someone he wants to be better for, but still fails to legitimately improve. He treats others poorly throughout the series, is handed a lot of things by sheer luck and connections, and refuses to accept responsibility for or make reparations with the people he failed. The writing of Scott as the core of the story isn't where the comic's failing us readers stops, however. The general air of the story goes even further to disappoint. So many characters are misogynistic, and most often the misogyny is perpetuated by other women. There are numerous examples of Ramona calling other women bitches, a couple examples of Knives doing it, and at least one from Envy. Now, while many characters are casually misogynistic within the fiction, there's also a subtle misogyny present in the narrative as well. I already mentioned that all of the girls in the story are props for Scott, but still. The women in Scott's life are obsessed with him. Knives is literally obsessed, to the point of having a shrine. Kim moved to the town Scott is in for him, and Envy is still low-key hung up on Scott despite having broken up with him for her career over a year ago. Even Lisa, someone who didn't express interest in Scott when she was friends with him in high school, suddenly wants a piece of him during the story. None of them have agency beyond have feelings for Scott Pilgrim. Now, all people have their own emotions, and they process things at their own rate. However, Envy clearly didn't have that many attachments to Scott. She was implied to be cheating on him during her time dating him, and dumped him in order to further her career. When Scott tried to see her again, with the haircut, as she had demanded, she tells him to get out of her life. I could see Envy feeling bad for how she treated Scott. She seems to miss something about her life before the band, and Scott symbolizes that on some level. He was with her before she grew big, and he tried to stick with her until she spurned him off. It's justified that Envy would desire some semblance of realness outside of her life as a celebrity, and perhaps even the unhindered dedication of someone like Scott. It seems like there's no one consistently by her side during her fame, as people are similarly shallow and only ever use her. However, her soft spot is never really explored beyond that. Which I just realized is all speculation on my end. <sighs> oh, god damn it! I can't believe that I just speculated at that. Ah, oh, fuck, there's not even, like, evidence for what I think is hit there. It's not even, it's not even in the text. Envy's just, like, Envy's just, like, obsessed with Scott. But, like, it, they don't, they don't ever really say, say why. So, like, you just have to connect the dots on your own and think, like, oh, maybe it's because she's sick of being famous. But, like, it's not in the text. The text itself doesn't say why she still thinks about Scott. God damn it. Her patience for him during his depression is too much, and she's far too forgiving in that moment. Of course, the reason she was so patient is because she was doing it for Gideon, so go figure. Anyway, Kim Pines also doesn't really make sense. Kim is a bitter and angry woman. Kim is rarely seen smiling. She doesn't really like people and tends to be derisive even to her friends at times. Kim's breakup with Scott was also even longer than Envy's was, and yet she also still has hang-ups with Scott. She kisses him before finally sending him off to finally confront Gideon, and... for what? Why is she still stuck on him? Why isn't that explored at all? Lisa also has a bit of a thing for Scott. She seems a bit fun and flirty around Scott, she takes him away from the group of friends to chat one-on-one, -on -one, and she openly admits to desiring at least a fling with him. She also is the only character who has even the smallest amount of exploration for why she feels the way she does, and it's just, I liked the attention. The issue with this story isn't that these women feel the way that they do, but rather that there is nothing in the story about why they feel this way. For Envy, it could be nostalgia. For Kim, it could also be nostalgia. For Knives, it could be latching onto the positive influence that Scott left with her, what little there was anyway. And for Ramona, 
it could be just that she started dating Scott on an unhealthy whim and his devotion grew on her. All of the women in the series are underdeveloped. None of them see any growth separately from their relationship with Scott, but the men continue to go and live their own lives, separate from Scott. Wallace Wells finds himself a nice boyfriend and a steady relationship, someone he moves in with. So does Stephen Stills, who comes out as gay and is dating Joseph. Stephen also starts a new band and performs in it. Nil doesn't really see as much development, but he honestly wasn't very involved in the story in the first place, so that's fine and we'll ignore him. You might have noticed a pattern in those men. They're gay. See, Scott Pilgrim actually has some really great and wholesome MLM representation. Wallace is a hilarious and self-assured character who consistently acts as a guiding force that keeps Scott on the right path. Steven is more of a mess than Wallace is, but Steven still does his best as a person, and he puts in the work to try and see Sex Bob-omb be successful. Steven also was dating a character that everyone hates, Julie, for a long while until he meets Joseph and starts recording the album with him. It's somewhere between then and the end that they start officially dating and he breaks up with Julie for the last time. Stephen coming to terms with the sexuality happens off-page, and Scott doesn't even find out about it until Volume 6, when he sees the two of them kiss. Wallace's relationship with Mobile also happens mostly off-page, and we only see Mobile a couple of times near the end of the series. Technically, Kim also has a relationship that happens largely off-page that Scott has nothing to do with, much like Wallace and Stephen. However, her ex cheats on her, and she doesn't find contentment or joy in her relationship, unlike the two gay men. This casual representation where it doesn't really make a big deal out of characters being gay is great. There are numerous jokes Wallace makes and humorous moments centering around Wallace are just fantastic, like the part where he steals Stacy's date and the time it took her to go to the bathroom and come back out. However, this happiness away from Scott is not given the women, and this representation is not extended to gay women especially. WOW relationships exist either as jokes or something kinky for the men viewing them to enjoy. There are three explicit examples of lesbians being mentioned that demonstrate this. The first is this awful joke scene where Kim and Knives are drunk and making out at the beach house. This didn't need to exist. The next is of Scott asking Ramona if she's ever kissed a girl. When she says yes, Scott, quote, shivers with delight. The third is when Scott confronts Ramona and Roxy and shouts, you had a sexy phase? When Ramona claims her dating Roxy was just a phase. While Scott was living with Wallace, he also had a poster of two girls kissing, which he offered to Kim after the whole making out with knives thing. There are some extremely minor implications that Ramona had a crush on Kim, but they're so subtle that you would barely notice them if you drove over them at 50 miles an hour. The way that the story uses lesbians and bisexuality is one of fetishism. There's a storied history behind the sexualization and objectification of lesbians and bi women by Alice Hishet men. And Scott shivering with delight and calling Ramona's relationship with Roxy a sexy phase is an uncritical reflection of that fetishism. So, now we've run into the same disparity between depictions of men and women. Men are allowed to develop and become better, women are not. Men are allowed to love each other and enter relationships, but women cannot. Men's relationships with each other are just for them, but women's relationships with each other are turn-ons for men. We're back to the comic's perpetual misogyny. Scott Pilgrim, as a comic series, doesn't like women unless they're acting as footstools for men. The women in the story don't do things of their own volition. None of them have motivations besides live and pine for Scott Pilgrim on varying levels. Envy was the only one with sights set higher than Scott, but even she returns her gaze to him. Why is this the case? Well, Scott Pilgrim is filled with video game references and jokes. The first fight with an ex is framed like a Street Fighter type brawl, all of the exes turn into money when they're defeated, there's a Gradius type game that Scott plays at one point, as well as a Monster Hunter, there's a save point, a 1-up, and a Tanuki suit reference. All of that is on top of numerous chapter titles referencing various video games. This is a comic series about an unemployed gamer who plays bass guitar in a band in the first decade of the 21st century. Now, I don't have time to get into the whole history of it, there are other, better resources for this, but sexism is deeply baked into gaming. From the 90s forward, games started to exclusively target boys as their target audience. 
Gaming was largely seen as a boys club, and boys consistently ignored girls who played games, seeing them as being one of two tropes, either a mom who plays Farmville, or a gamer girl just doing it for attention. By nature of being rife with video game references, without using the references to say something about the nature of video games and how they affect Scott, the entire comic series ends up just reeking of this atmosphere. These jokes act as something of a gate for the audience. If you don't get the jokes, that's because you aren't a gamer. If you aren't a gamer, then this story isn't for you. This story is for gamers, all gamers are boys, and so this story is for boys. To further reinforce this, the only time a girl is part of a video game reference is when Kim is kidnapped in Volume 2, embodying the damsel in distress trope. In the references, the only place a girl is allowed to exist is still as a prop and motivator for the player, who is Scott Pilgrim. A man. The one time a girl is part of a video game reference, it perpetuates misogyny. As a result, we can safely conclude that the references made were indicators of the target audience. Young, Alice het men who are bad with women and who like to play video games. Now, I do not know Brian Lee O'Malley. I cannot accurately say what his intentions for this story were, but I believe I can safely say that his story is not interested in the well-being or growth of the women. The text makes this very clear, and there are interviews that support this as well. In a 2018 interview with the Anime News Network, O'Malley confirms some important things. For one thing, Scott Pilgrim was deeply inspired by his actual life in Toronto at the time he was writing it. His target audience was his friends, he had a gay roommate at the time, and when he later took those friends out to see a premiere of the Scott Pilgrim movie, it was awkward because the movie was his version of events. Worse yet, Scott Pilgrim is also, on some level, a self-insert. Brian Lee O'Malley himself said, quote, I've sometimes joked that Scott Pilgrim is my fantasy of being a cute white indie rock boy, which, as an ostracized mixed-race weirdo, was something I occasionally wished for when I was younger. End quote. This was said during a 2014 interview with Publishers Weekly. Real talk, that's not the end of it. I spent a lot of time reading interviews and looking for information. I was trying to figure out if O'Malley himself was gay in order to figure out his biases and why he would have great gay rep and men characters but fails so utterly as far as women were concerned. By the way, it was his gay roommate. In the earlier mentioned AV Club interview, O'Malley also says this about the women in the story. Quote, I always wanted to explore them and figure them out. That was me figuring the world out. I'm 25, or whatever, and just trying to understand women. Obviously, that is a process that never ends. End quote. And there's the fucking smoking gun. O'Malley professed he didn't understand women when he was writing the series, and possibly continued to struggle with understanding them five years later. Scott Pilgrim wasn't just flawed because it was unconcerned with women or misunderstood them, but it's flawed because the author didn't understand women, and wrote Scott Pilgrim as a way to try and understand them more. So, let's get something straight. Scott Pilgrim is something of a self-insert. The story is deeply inspired by real-life events that O'Malley experienced. Ramona is O'Malley's favorite character. This paints an absolutely wild picture of the entirety of Scott Pilgrim comics as being a huge self-insert fiction where O'Malley wrote himself dating this cool girl that he liked. Honestly, I absolutely hate that this is the conclusion that I came to, but everything points to this. O'Malley loving Ramona despite not even giving her a past or personality until Volume 5, all of the characters being based on people O'Malley actually knew, the setting being based on his three years in Toronto, tons of video game references that only exist as references, and the final nail in the coffin. Scott Pilgrim is my fantasy of being a cute white indie rock boy. All art is personal. Whenever someone creates a piece of art, they are projecting some part of themselves out through a creative medium. Sometimes this is a private affair. Sometimes it's incredibly public. However, all art is made with their own goals and biases in mind. Scott Pilgrim was essentially O'Malley's personal reflection in graphic novel form. It's barely veiled at all, and every interview where O'Malley talks about the series corroborates this fact. So where does this leave us? Well, unlike Scott Pilgrim, O'Malley is a real person who's still alive today. He's still making art, and he's still improving as a person. In many interviews, he's openly talked about wanting to create more representation of characters who aren't white in his stories. 
In his next work after Scott Pilgrim, Seconds, O'Malley writes a lot of characters who are far more fleshed out and real than any of the women in Scott Pilgrim. The best part is that it acknowledges that women can be gay and confused about their sexuality without it being a joke. Side note, Seconds is actually a really good work. Um, I really enjoyed reading it, and I do recommend it. It's such an incredible breath of fresh air in O'Malley's library, too, after having gone through all of Scott Pilgrim. I also read a hearty amount of Snot Girl, which was the serialized comic that he started after Seconds. Um, but as a serialized comic, it's burdened with the problems common in comics, so I won't really get into it. Okay, low-key, it also perpetuates O'Malley's propensity to give gay men representation while underrepresenting gay women. However, this time, it at least openly queerbaits the main villain as a lesbian, but I'm not getting into it. Okay, also, Snot Girl shows how obsessed with women's fashion O'Malley is, and you can see the obsession forming in Scott Pilgrim, but seriously, I cannot get into it. So, Scott Pilgrim is basically a time capsule of O'Malley's views from his time writing the books and his time in Toronto. It's his past, and it's not his present or his future. Scott fails to ever actually improve himself during his six books. Scott Pilgrim is a deeply flawed work, and it's highly reflective of the time it was published in. It's a poorly written, frequently misogynistic story with a self-insert main character that I've somehow never seen anyone criticize for being all of those things at once. It's not an evergreen work, and as each year goes by, we're going to see it wilt more and more. Public opinion of it has already changed what it used to be, and it's going to continue to change. Unlike Scott, we don't exist between the covers of a book. We keep living after one chapter ends. The thing that us readers can learn from Scott Pilgrim, and maybe even O'Malley as well, is that we can become better. Somehow, the story that fails to be about self-improvement still manages to be a cautionary tale about the importance of self-improvement. In June of 2020, Edgar Wright, the director of the Scott Pilgrim movie, announced that he had some plans to come back to the series in an anime form. It was made clear this wouldn't be a sequel or another straight adaptation, but details were incredibly light. As well, O'Malley expressed interest in not only this project, but returning to the characters in comic form to, quote, see what they're up to. Frankly, I don't see any way that this series can be adapted in a way that won't just bring the misogyny back to the forefront. To do so would require fundamentally changing the characters within the series to such a degree that some of them would be almost unrecognizable. Probably for the better. The misogyny and hashtag gamer moments are just too integral to the original work to make a new one without repeating all of the original's mistakes. Personally, I hope that neither of these projects mentioned see the light of day. As for something that does see the light of day, in September of 2020, the famously lost Scott Pilgrim video game made a comeback. It had been in purgatory for years due to licensing issues, but now it's back, and fans rejoiced. Personally, I disagree, considering the game uncritically portrays Knives and Kim as dating, which comes with the exact same burden of the age gap that Scott and Knives had in the first place. And Kim hated that Scott was dating Knives, but then Knives turns 18 and is suddenly back on the table? Kim is just as old as Scott. The age is still a problem. A common argument in favor of Scott Pilgrim that I heard while working on this video is that it's a comic about bad people who don't really get better, and that that's true to life, which makes it enjoyable. While I can't really take away anyone's opinion or interpretation, and while there is some validity to that reading, I don't agree. If the story was just supposed to be about bad people living their lives and not getting better, then the lip service paid to character growth wouldn't be featured so prominently, and it wouldn't legitimately convince people that Scott improved. Things like the power of love, the power of understanding, defeating Nega Scott, and the destruction of Ramona's bag feel like big moments of character growth, even though they don't really speak to anything. The only positive things that exist in the series are the aforementioned gay men, the very appealing art style, and the usually witty humor. Everything else drags the series down to the point of just... wearing me out. Over the course of this project, I have become entirely tired of talking about Scott Pilgrim. I'm tired of hearing people talk about bringing it back. I'm sick of Twitter advertising to me a Scott Pilgrim watch party because I tweeted about how I think Envy Adams was coded as trans. 
I just want the series to be left in the past. It's a product of its time, and we've long since moved on from then. Thanks for watching. Right now, you're seeing my patrons over at Patreon credited on screen. If you liked my analysis of Scott Pilgrim, feel free to like and subscribe. I'm honestly interested in what you all think too, because the only thing more powerful than my hatred of Scott Pilgrim is my hubris. So, comments if you have any thoughts you want to add. I don't plan on talking about the movie or the game any further than the brief mentions here, so don't ask about those. Uh, lastly, Brian Lee O'Malley, if you watched my video that's about half as long as your movie is, I did really like Seconds, and I look forward to Worst World. I earnestly think that you become a far greater author after the end of Scott Pilgrim, and I really hope you keep up the momentum and don't return to the series.